Today, I'm joined by Dr. Eveline Moo, a research fellow at Her Centre Australia, who focuses on the understanding of the neurological impact of trauma. Trauma and traumatic stress are known to have lasting impacts on the brain and can lead to conditions like complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Eveline's research looks at individuals who suffer from chronic PTSD, and today we'll be unpacking exactly what this condition is, the kinds of symptoms people experience, what types of treatments are available to help anyone suffering from this condition. During our conversation, we unpack the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder versus PTSD, the types of trauma that may cause this, and what friends or family can do to support people with this diagnosis. Eveline also shares some exciting new clinical research with promising results. Let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I wonder, would you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a neuroscientist? Yeah, so a neuroscientist is someone who's very interested in focuses in the brain and things that happen within the brain regions. Um, brain networks, neurochemistry, and um, neurotransmitters. Um, yeah, so all of that, how that impacts individuals' lives, mental health conditions, and so much more. And is that something that you always wanted to be? Yeah, so for the longest time, I draw my inspirations from Grey's Anatomy, which is a bit lame, but um, being interested in everything that they talked about in terms of neuroscience and neurosurgery there, was really interested in, in that. Then did my um, undergrad in psychology, Again, was interested in the effects of the brain and how the brain works. So then focus, um, continue on my research in neuroscience. And you're based at the Her Centre in Melbourne with Professor J. Ashri Kulkarni, who we absolutely love here. Um, what's it like working there? It's very, very, it's amazing everything that we do. I can't really put it into words. It's exciting. We're doing a lot of novel um, treatment, clinical trials. We're trying to better understand mental health conditions from a women's perspective. So it's a lot of exciting things that we're doing. Okay, amazing. And what are your special interests? Um, so women's mental health across the lifespan. Um, so the impacts especially of early life trauma or abuse, um, hormonal fluctuations in resulting in mental ill health, particularly in women. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, trauma is a big one. So my um, focus is on borderline personality disorder which we hit the term of, and also complex PTSD. Okay, so so as a doctor, complex PTSD is a much newer term that we've only started talking about recently. And um, I hear some people using it sort of interchangeably with borderline personality disorder. I wonder if you could tell us what, what is complex PTSD and are those two uh, um, labels interchangeable? Yep, so starting off with, complex PTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a mental health condition that arises from prolonged and um, repeated exposures to traumatic events, typically involving um, abuse, uh, domestic violence, prolonged neglect. And as you mentioned, CPTSD is a relatively newer term that we're using condition. And it was only, I believe it was coined in 1990s by Judith Herman and then only introduced in 2019 in the International Trauma um, Classification of Diseases, 11th edition. So it is relatively new and it sort of came about as a newer or better fitting label for those with borderline personality disorder, which is highly stigmatized. It essentially says that you as an individual have an issue, it can't really fix you as a person because it's your personality. Um, but really, if you better understand these people with borderline personality disorder, um, they come from a lot of uh, trauma in their early childhood. So a lot of symptoms that are showing up are responses to trauma. So here at Her Centre, we completely hate the word BPD. So we do prefer to use CPTSD, particularly for those who do have a trauma history. I agree. I have to say, as a, a, a GP who's always had a special interest in mental health, I often find that patients weren't treated terribly well if they had a borderline personality disorder in comparison to other mental health diagnoses. And I always find it so frustrating because as as you say, these these patients are often the people who had been sexually abused as children or had had extreme neglect, et cetera, et cetera. And there just seemed to be quite limited compassion, but also it was nearly like you were blaming someone for their personality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. With 
the people that we speak to who do trials in our at our centre, they hesitantly reach out to us because their experience in the medical system or mental health system is has been appalling. Um, a lot of them don't want to get help or speak about getting help because with a label of BPD, it's automatically, oh, you can't can't really fix you because it's a you problem. But yeah, understanding the trauma that they've had um, and then better navigating treatments for trauma, it has been shown to be a lot more effective. But again, it is a debate. So a lot of people do agree on the newer change, but there are people who are still believe that they're two completely different identities. Okay, that's interesting. When I was working um, as a psychiatric doctor back in Northern Ireland 20 plus years ago, uh, certainly, you know, I, there would be comments like, oh, she's just a personality disorder. There's nothing we can do. So what has changed in terms of our understanding of what what is going on in someone's brain who has complex PTSD and what can we do? Yeah, so obviously with a lot of um, repeated uh, trauma and stresses that they've had, usually for months and years at a time, this has a lot of impact on the brain and particular areas of the brain that are involved in emotional regulation, memory processing and stress response. So to name a couple is the amygdala, which is the, plays a crucial role in processing emotions. Um, and this is often hyperactivated in the population, so that explains how or why they have heightened fear responses, hypervigilance, um, and exaggerated emotional reactions. Another one is the hippocampus, um, an area of the brain that is involved in um, memory formation and retrieval. So uh, studies have found that this is typically reduced in the population, uh, and this leads to the difficulties with memory, the flashbacks and the truths of thoughts that they have, and also trouble distinguishing between what's currently happening in their lives and what has happened in the past in the trauma. So if I can just take you back, what is hypervigilance and how that, how might that present? Could you give us some examples? Yeah. So with people who have experienced trauma, which could be PTSD or CPTSD, um, they tend to be quite on edge and being on a lookout for a lot of things that's happening to them. Um, Very, very mindful of the settings that their trauma have occurred and being um, yeah, really careful what's happening, but really just the high alert, um, ready for flight or flight reaction. Ready to run away from situations. I know I have a patient who um, the smell of red wine is very triggering um, for her because her abuser would drink red wine beforehand. And if she smells red wine, she often has to leave wherever it is. So a similar story that we've had is also um, hearing stories of women who uh, were raped when um, they were in an orange farm, I believe it was. So the smell of oranges is what triggers them to um, be quite, um, yeah, stressed. And whenever I eat oranges now, I'm kind of thinking, oh, okay, something that doesn't affect me can affect someone else. Yeah, it's amazing. That's something that you and I potentially don't have to even consider. So what's the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder? Yep. So it comes down to the occurrence of the um, the trauma. So with PTSD, it is the often the one-time event that's uh, like a natural disaster or a car accident, um, whereas the complex PTSD is that prolonged and repeated trauma exposure that they have, which could be um, bullying or neglect that they've had during their childhood. Uh, domestic violence is another one. Um, people in high-risk occupation, occupations such as uh, first aid responders. Um, yeah, so it's the difference is the timing, not the timing, but the um, occurrence of it. So one-off event, PTSD. CPTSD is the more complex um, ongoing um, trauma they've had. And is there a marker of the level of trauma? Like I know I have a few patients with complex PTSD who nearly feel a little bit undeserving of that title because they feel that their trauma wasn't as bad as other people's, for example. Yeah. So what we find is in all the things that we do at research at Her Centre is um, accepting trauma as it is for that individual. So understanding their story, we, as I mentioned, what is a traumatic for me might not be for you, but yeah, it has to take it for the person's word. You can't have a threshold and saying, okay, well, you've been bullied five times. That shouldn't affect you. But yeah, it really comes down to how it affects the individual in their daily life. And is complex PTSD something that can only happen 
you know, in child or adolescence and then go into adult? What about like an adult who has been bullied for years in their workplace, for example, or is in a domestic violence situation for the first time in their life? Can they develop complex PTSD? Yeah, definitely. So it it occurs most of the people um, do have it in the childhood, but it doesn't stop to say that whatever happens in adulthood um, does also relate or go on to develop CPTSD. As you mentioned with uh, domestic violence, that's usually in adulthood. Um, We've had a lot of people with workplace bullying um, and that's been labelled as issues with adaptating with their environment. But it can definitely happen in adulthood and a lot of the times it can happen in adulthood. So what symptoms, if if someone's listening and they're wondering whether perhaps they have PTSD or, or, or CPTSD, what what kind of symptoms might people experience? Yeah, so in response to trauma, a lot of people have um, with CPTSD have emotional dysregulation, which include intense emotions, um, emotional numbness, um, frequent mood swings as well, and also dissociation. There is the other end of Can negative- I just stop you there? So can you tell us what, what is dissociation? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So dissociation is just um, removing yourself from reality and what's happening in that moment. A lot of people um, go to a different memory or just snap out of things, um, but just, yeah, the removal from reality. So they're kind of zoning out and going into like a little bit of a trance to just yeah. escape that. that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the dissociation usually comes about when um, when they're hypervigilant and th- assume that what is happening is going to evoke more stress for them. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Uh, so it is actually, yeah, the emotional dysregulation, um, negative self-perception and chronic shame and guilt. Having guilt, feeling that a lot of the things that happen around them is because of themselves. Uh, difficulties with relationships is a big one. So having trust issues or isolating themselves, not wanting to interact with people. Um, and the PTSD side of things, so re-experiencing the trauma, having the flashbacks and having intrusive thoughts as well. And in terms of... What's a normal response to trauma? Like what's an acceptable, like if you've been in a natural disaster or in a car accident or been involved in a very traumatic incident, like what is normal and when does it become a problem? Yeah, so obviously after a traumatic event, everyone reacts differently and it's the first initial kind of shock, um, quite stressed, quite hypervigilant, quite on edge. Um, I guess when it becomes an issue is when it does impact your daily life and it does impact your ability to work or have relationships or if your perception of yourself becomes so negative that it does relate to any self-harm or impulsive actions. So I guess that's where the threshold in if it's affecting you in a way that normally shouldn't wouldn't have packed it, um, that's when I think you need to definitely seek help. And do we know what percentage of the population probably have CPTSD? Yeah, so the research is quite new around CPTSD. So the numbers are between, I believe, 1% to 8% in the general population. But as we touched on earlier, it might be masked by those who are the diagnosis of BPD who um, potentially should be in the CPTSD category. And in terms of do we know if you have a child, so maybe someone's listening and they know of a child or there's a child in their life who they know has recently gone through some kind of traumatic event or has been abused or neglected and they're now in a safe space. Is there anything that can be done in a kind of early intervention capacity to prevent that child or adolescent going on to develop uh, CPTSD or does everyone who's been abused go on to develop that. Yeah, no. So definitely early signs of when the child acts differently, um, any changes in the behavior, especially um, perhaps maybe avoiding things or people. So better understanding that and flagging it with the child itself or, um, but obviously in a safe environment with them to speak about the trauma that they've had. Um, So yeah, definitely around that. But not everyone that experiences repeated trauma or abuse will go on to um, develop CPTSD and that relates to the resilience that people might have um, especially in response to stress or trauma. Um, some people might even have genetic variations where their body's reaction to stress is um, I guess better um, so they don't then go on to develop CPTSD. And do we have any sort of things that indicate things that we can do to make 
people more resilient per se. I sometimes hate that phrase, by the way, resilience. I know. Again, it sometimes feels like you're blaming the person. Oh, why were not you not more resilient. resilient to cope with, you know, that awful trauma? And that's not what I mean at all. But, you know, are, are there any things that we can learn from from that situation? Yeah, so I think a lot of it um, when we're speaking about early childhood is having that secure and safe um, relationship with the parent or um, important people in their lives, having that safe environment tends to um, have people to cope with stress better so that when they are presented with trauma, they've got the coping strategies to deal with it um, because it, when they don't have that coping strategies is when they then go on to develop um, more stress in the body, which leads to the issues with the brain regions and such. And so you guys are obviously kind of at the forefront of this. What are the treatment strategies and an approach that you guys are researching and developing at the minute? Yeah, so we currently have many clinical trials across the different conditions that we focus on, but particularly in complex PTSD, we've got two clinical trials. Um, one of them is using memantine, which is a Alzheimer's medication actually, um, but it targets the glutamate system. So our working theory is that those who are exp um, expressed or um put in a lot of stress that goes into overdrive of the glutamate system, which is a major neurotransmitter that we have in our, uh, in our brain. Um, and with that, the hyperactivity leads to the difficulty having um, intense emotions and having issues with relationships and impulsivity. So uh, with that trial, trialing memantine for 12 weeks, um, and we administer a lot of validated and well-structured uh, measures to measure the symptoms to compare before and after. So at baseline, pre-treatment, then we compare it again at week 12. Um, we're about to publish these results, so I can't tell you too much, but I can say it's very promising. A lot of people have been saying that it's a miracle or magic pill that they've used because the current treatment of antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications just aren't cutting it. Um, so that's that one. And then the other one is we're using estradiol. So I'm sure Jay Shree spoke to you about this, but her long a long use and um, reputation in using gonadal hormone treatments in mental health. So we're using estradiol in a gel form, um, and these are for women with CPTSD. And exactly the same, it's a 12-week um, clinical trial, similar assessments. Um, and the theory with using estradiol is that with um, women who experience trauma and stress, that definitely has impacts on their hormones that are occurring in the brain. Or, um, and with that we want to replace them or give them estrogen, um, an estradiol form to help improve their mood. And are you able to tell us so far what that's looking like? That's actually a more newer study that we have with recruitment still undergoing way. But again, it's a similar response of um, the mood. So the antidepressants that never really helped them before the estradiol is now working. Um, and differently with the memantine, a lot of people have been saying that's allowed them to stop reassess the situation before emotionally reacting. So acts, acts like a circuit breaker for them, which has positive effects on their um, interpersonal relationships. So I have to say over the years, I have noticed, and, and a few of my patients who have CPTSD or BPD diagnoses have said that they are worse at certain times in their menstrual cycle. Is that something that has been researched or confirmed? Yeah, so a lot of we do, we definitely collect a lot of information from people when they participate and hormones and menstrual cycle is one of them. Um, and it definitely has to play with the fluctuation of the hormones that they have. So usually within the luteal phase, so about the 10 days before their, um, their bleed, they do have the drop in estrogen. So they do have the lower mood, um, which goes again with the menstrual cycle. So having estrogen in those time or estradiol in those time does help improve mood. And what about, um, obviously we talk a lot on this podcast about perimenopause and menopause. Are we seeing that patients who have BPD or CPTSD have worse symptoms in the perimenopause and, and maybe the postmenopause? Yeah, definitely. So um, people with BPD slash CPTSD have exacerbation of their symptoms um, during that uh, time chain transition that women go through through menopause. Um, so definitely with Jaytree's work with the hormone treatments, that does help a lot of the symptoms that they have when it is exacerbated. And do we understand exactly what's going on? Obviously, my understanding, and you're the neuroscientist, so um, my understanding is that estrogen's a little bit 
like the conductor of the orchestra in the brain and is really very modulating with regards to neurotransmitters. But could you maybe explain a little bit about what is estrogen doing in the brain? And what's happening whenever we're in chaos? Yeah, so the estrogen we like to consider as a neuroprotective agent. So it has a lot of protective factors on the brain and what happens in the brain. Um, So whenever there is a drop or the fluctuation of the estrogens, that's where people do um, have the low mood. So um, it's very powerful. Um, People don't think, people just think estrogen or sex hormones just happen waist down, nothing above but it has a tremendous impact on the brain and everything that happens around it. And so it would seem that we definitely need to be really pushing this um, research forward regarding estrogen and the brain because clearly um, half the population who are postmenopausal are kind of trucking along with uh, probably quite an important um, neurotransmitter in their brain. Yeah, definitely. And I think that women, we go through a lot. We have required thresholds for a lot of things. So when we start picking up that um, the prevalence of a specific condition is more in females or it happens with menopause about a certain um, age period, that something just doesn't go right, then we need to look biologically what is happening in the female. And a lot of the time it is the hormones. And I do know that this age group, sort of the 45 to 55 on average, seem to have an increased rate of suicide and suicidality and self-harm. Um, do we know why that is? Yeah, so it does you say the age bracket and what happens in that age bracket is that women are going through menopause and because the term of menopause or depression isn't really acknowledged in the medical field or not much known is known about it, a lot of women are going um, under the radar of not getting help or because they think there's nothing that can get help for. So it is unfortunate that it does lead to suicide, um, but definitely having more awareness around what's happening during menopause, aside from the physical symptoms, that mental ill health can occur as well. And I know that your background, you started off in psychology and we've talked a little bit about the treatments that are in in trial phase at the minute in terms of medications. But, But in terms of psychology, do we know what types of psychology are beneficial for people who've got CPTSD? Yeah, so in terms of um, CPTSD psychotherapy treatments, um, one of them is the trauma-focused CBT, so cognitive behavioural therapy. And this type of therapy is, uh, is specifically designed to help individuals process their traumatic memories and change that negative thought patterns that they have. Um, and it essentially just combines the trauma processing with cognitive restricting and coping strategies. Um, another one that's commonly... Can I, um, I'm just going to stop you there. What does that mean? <laughs> Can you explain that a little bit more? What does cognitive restricting mean? Yeah, so cognitive restricting is just limiting the negative thoughts or um, your negative thoughts that they might have that is associated to the trauma that they have. Um, so changing their thinking and their beliefs of the trauma event um, is the focus of the CBT uh, treatment. Um, and then the other one is uh, EMDR, which is... Um, Eye movement, sorry, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is another form of therapy that helps individuals process and integrate the um, traumatic memories by guided eye movements, or it could be a response to a tap or a sound. Um, And this is all happening by the therapist while they're recalling the traumatic events. And essentially what they're trying to do is reduce the emotional charge so that um, bad connotation with the trauma with new memories. So those are the kind of Two main ones that I think have a lot more research and its effectiveness on it. Right, okay. And in terms of um, patients who've maybe had trauma, who feel like, oh no, I'm not going to go to a therapist and I don't I don't want to talk about it. One of the things I often say is, well, you're thinking about it all the time anyway, so why don't we get it out there and kind of work through it? But um, do you find that patients are really reluctant to go there? Um. I don't think so. I, I I have two minds in it. So if they have a BPD label, then I feel like they're very reluctant to talk about their traumas or their their um yeah troubled past. But I feel like a lot of these people with CPTSD that we see are more pro um getting help and treatment because 
it removes that kind of personality. It's a you problem, but it's more something has happened to you and now there is help that is out there that is trauma focused. And so do you feel like for people with the CPTSD diagnosis that the future does look brighter than it did before? Because certainly in my younger years as a doctor, it was like, oh, there is no treatment. Um, it's their personality. Um, you know, what, what are the chances of recovery? Yeah, so there are definitely more research, more things are happening. We're advancing in technology and the drugs that we make. Um, so it is promising and there are like our trials that we're trying to publish is the use of memantine. So not creating new drug per se, but just repurposing drugs that um, we know can help target specific brain um, networks that yeah would help improve the symptoms. And in terms of obviously you're a researcher, for anyone listening, uh, how long is it likely to take? So if you have a successful trial and you've got good results, how long is it likely to take for for example, the team to trickle through and become an available therapy for this. Yeah, so it's a pretty long process that we have to go through. Just even to get our work published can be quite long. Um, so that usually takes up to potentially up to a year to get the results out there to the public. Um, and once that's out there, um, we can start talking to um, organisations such as the TGA. But that also involves having larger scale clinical trials, so having more people at different sites across Australia, perhaps, or overseas, just so that we can replicate the findings. But having said that, if we're using a medication that is already available, um, oftentimes with our study that we write a letter to their GP to um, recommend them to continue on memantine, which GPs can prescribe. And so basically on the basis of your recommendation, the GP can prescribe in an off-licensed scenario yes yes yeah. and in terms of where you think where's all of this going to go next what what's going to happen next with the treatment and care of people with complex PTSD yeah so um, it's a exciting time with research aspect definitely we're definitely looking at um, more ways of understanding complex PTSD in neuroscience perspective um, and with that we have a better understanding of how, how we could treat people, what other treatments we could use. But it's it's a new it's a new newer label. Um, and I'm just glad to hear that treating doctors like yourself are aware of CPTSD and that there is help that they can get out there. And if anyone listening maybe has a family member or a friend who they know has been through, you know, a tra traumatic childhood, are there any do's or don'ts that you would recommend having talked to all the people you've met what are the things that are the worst thing you can say to people with this diagnosis and what are the most helpful things that you might be able to do? Yeah, so helpful would be creating a safe space for them to speak um, without judgment, um, having patience for them as well. Um, another thing for a loved one is to understand what CPTSD is so you can have a better understanding of their behaviour or their thought processes and not judge them in what they do. What not to do is to tell them to get over it. <laughs> Um, and not to tell people to just tell you about their trauma if they don't feel safe to. So no, no pressure in that kind of sense. Um, but definitely um, providing that support to them, um, being there for them, but also highlighting to yourself that there are limits that you can do as a support person um, and also being aware of uh, what needs you need as well to be able to support someone with CPTSD. Are there associations between CPTSD and other mental health disorders, like, for example, eating disorders? Yes. Yeah, so we find that um, trauma as a collective whole does impact a lot of different mental health conditions. And we do find a lot of people with um, CPTSD do have a form of um, eating disorder. Um, and that relates to having control of the situation. Um, so yeah, a lot of the participants that we see do have the comorbidity of the two together. And what about addictions? Does that tend to go hand in hand as well? Definitely with addiction as well. So with CPTSD, another symptom that they tend to have is the impulsivity and the impulsivity could relate to alcohol and drug use, um, and with higher prevalence between the two. And the other one that I was thinking there is increased risk of self-harm. Yep, definitely. So with um, CPTSD and BPD, there is a high risk of um, self-harm, um, suicidal thoughts, intrusive thoughts that they have. And a lot of the time is a response of wanting to stop feeling the pain that they feel. 
So it's very unfortunate that it gets to that. Um, and then it, it gets exaggerated when they try to get help. And if they do have the BPD label, they get turned away. So it's unfortunate, but yeah, um, self-harm is very high in this population. And completed suicide is also high. I think sometimes people think it's not. They think that these patients just constantly self-harm, but don't really mean it. But actually, my understanding is that they've got a very high rate of completed suicide as well. High rate, definitely high rate as well. So um, a lot of the fortunate stories that we hear, but I won't share too much, is that after after a while, it does lead to going a bit too far or they do um, commit. So it is very, very sad that that happens. And I was going to ask you a little bit, because I know that you're also interested in autism in women. And I wondered whether you could tell me what your thoughts on, because obviously we, we, we get lots of um, statistics and ratios and we're told that autism is much more common in men than women. Um, and I just wondered whether your thoughts were that it really is less common or it's just less commonly diagnosed. Yeah, you raise a good point with the um, neurodivergency in terms of autism and ADHD. So the prevalence is, I think it's quite equal. It's just that women are known to be better maskers of the symptoms, um, particularly with ADHD. But women, yeah, it is more prevalent in men, but women also do have autism and it does come out differently. Um, in this, in the different sexes. So whenever you say masking, what does that mean? So with society's expectation of women, we tend to be quite, um, I guess, uh, able to cope with a lot of different tasks at one time. So um, with ADHD, for example, uh, high-level women who are directors or CEO of companies, they might have, the in their minds, it's racing with mild, mild, really things happening, but that gets taken as a woman being busy as opposed to potentially having ADHD. Okay. And what do you think the implications are for having a much later diagnosis? Yep. So later diagnosis is definitely um, the treatments that you have could be harder to help, especially with therapy. Um, So that's why we tend to say for people with ADHD or autism, it's very, very important that that is detected early on. So then we can um, set in places to help and reduce the ongoing and, um, I guess, worse impacts in later adulthood. One of the groups of women that I'm seeing a lot of at the minute are my perimenopausal women who are presenting, requesting referrals to psychiatry and psychology for help with testing because they're, maybe their children have been diagnosed with ADHD or um, they've been, you know, listening to podcasts or reading things online. And they're having kind of aha moments where they're going, um, okay, this is actually me. I can't, I never can finish anything, et cetera, et cetera. Do we know why um, that perimenopausal period seems to be sort of unmasking um, this issue? Yeah. So especially around that time, it's a lot of tipping point with a lot of things in, I guess, in their normal private lives, a lot is going on um, and they don't get that time to really then stop to think more clearly, I guess. But I guess around that menopause or perimenopausal time is when the estrogen drops and a lot of it does get exacerbated and um, a lot of things do come to light around that time. Yeah, couple that with, you know, poor sleep and feeling fatigued and your brain feeling really foggy. Um, do we know, sorry to, to put you on the spot, but do we know why our brain's all foggy? Brain's all foggy. So that's my colleague. I believe she was on your podcast a, a couple months ago, um, Associate Professor Caroline Gerbich. But it does come into play again with um, estrogen and how that can also affect with the brain fog. Um, yeah, I can't speak too much more about that one. No, that's all right. I'm putting you on the spot. So basically, we need lots more research, particularly into women's brains. And that's what you guys are doing at the Her Centre. So I believe you guys have another conference coming up and I attended that conference last year. I have to say it was probably um, my favorite conference of my whole medical career. I thought it was amazing. Um, So you've got another conference coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about what to expect and who might interest to come to the conference? Yeah, definitely. So after a huge success of our first one last year, um, we have our second Asia Pacific Conference on Women's Mental Health, and that will be um, on the 9th to the 11th of October in Melbourne at the Chadston Hotel. So it's very glamorous. 
Um, and on this three day, there will be a welcome reception. There will be then two jam jam packed days of talking about um, clinical practice, research, and um, lived experience as well. So covering across all of women's mental health. Last year we did have a more focus on menopause, but this year we do and are going to look at more of the CPTSD or trauma on violence, um, eating disorders, ADHD, and um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder as well. So it's a more, um, I guess, spread out uh, topics that we're doing. And we have a range of amazing guests as well. So one of them is Grace Tame, the 2021 Australian of the Year will be um, one of our keynote speakers. Professor J. Shrikulkani will be speaking, who doesn't love to hear us speak. Um, we also have a uh, doctor from the Netherlands who specializes in adult ADHD. She'll be talking via Zoom. And we also have Senator Larissa Waters, who is the Australian Greens leader um, in the Senate for, um, yeah, so a w- range of women speaking and a couple of that with people with lived experience to give um, their perspective as well. And who's it for? Is it just for doctors or? No, sorry. Yes, you did ask about that. So it is for doctors. We are trying to target the more clinical um, audience. So there'd be um, uh, GPs, uh, psychiatrists, or it could be psychologists, allied health nurses. Um, but it is also open to the public as well. So um, whoever's interested in women's mental health and understanding the new practices and new research that's happening in the area are more than welcome to attend as well. So if you could get a message out there that you wish more people knew about uh, complex PTSD to start with, what would you wish that people knew about that subject? Um, in, the, in its name itself, it's very, very complex. It's a very new research area, so there is a lot to learn about, but Definitely understanding and listening to the person that's speaking and understanding the trauma history of the type, timing and severity of it all to then um, create a treatment plan that is trauma-focused is very, very important. One of the things that I always think is sometimes patients will say to me, oh, I should be over it by now. I feel embarrassed that I haven't got over it and I'm still looking backwards. But whenever you hear that you're explaining that there's actually physical changes within the brain you know it really does explain why people can't just get over it no definitely not that's like you mentioned there's a lot that's happening besides the event happening to you and you thinking about it, it happening it's physiologically a lot has changed in the body your stress responses that all change as well so it does take time with either being therapy or be with medication um it does take time so don't be hard on yourself, definitely not. And do we know, or maybe the research hasn't been done yet, but do we know if those brain changes are reversible? Yeah, so I think that's still earlier days in the CPTSD population um, for it to be reversible, but there definitely can be medications or therapies that can help in those gaps that people have, especially with their memory or their cognition. Okay, amazing. Um, you've been so helpful and uh, we've learned a lot today. Um, I'm I'm just wondering if you were able to tell your twenty maybe you are twenty something anyway <laughs> what you would tell what you would tell your younger self and um, if you could give her a message I'll give her a lot of messages if I can go back in time but definitely the big one that I think about quite often is to not be so hard on myself uh, twenty years young you're still learning a lot of things and what you learn in your twenties can it's not always bad if you do a mistake. You learn from it and you improve better. So definitely being less harsh on myself because there have been times where I think I want everything to be perfect and then burning myself out. It just never worked out well. But things that I thought were quite stressful back then in comparison now, I think there were just nothing. So everything into perspective. Yeah, don't sweat the small stuff. But I suppose that's also an important message for um, anyone listening who has complex PTSD or a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder is probably to be a little bit kinder to yourself because you've obviously been through extreme traumas to have got to this point. And hopefully the medical profession and everyone who wraps around that is going to treat you with a lot more compassion than you probably would have had even 10 years ago because we have opened our eyes and a lot of us can see that, you know, telling someone to get over it or pull themselves together or you know they just need to put it in the past and 
think about the future is definitely not the way to go. No, definitely and definitely. And there are there are people out there who are supporters as well. So we're all rooting for you. So um, yeah, don't give up and never blame yourself for it. And if um, anyone listening wanted to become part of any of your trials, is that a possibility for them to become involved in any of the trials that you definitely, guys are doing? Definitely. So um, contact us at hercentreaustralia at monash.edu. Um, and from there, we can put you in touch in the relevant teams for um, which projects might be available to you. We can work remotely for some of the sessions. So we try to make it as easy for the participant as possible for them to get the help. And there are good re- resources on the Her Centre website as well. So yeah, we'll a have lot a lot of resources there. Um, so yeah, it's a one-stop shop for a lot of CPTSD um, research. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And I look forward to meeting you in person in a few weeks. Definitely. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having me on the podcast. When I started this podcast back in December 23, I knew that I was lucky enough to have amazing conversations with various health professionals across all facets of medicine and allied health. And I knew that you would probably really enjoy being a fly on the wall to hear what we talked about. And that's how the podcast was born. And what you probably don't know is that this is a bit of a passion project. We don't have any sponsors or funding. And without your help, we won't be able to continue bringing you these great guests. So if you can please spread the word about the podcast, share it with someone who you think might benefit from the conversation that you've just listened to, or if you can leave us a review or a comment, it would mean the absolute world because that actually helps the podcast spread further and get more people to hear our message and hopefully allow us to invite bigger and bigger guests onto the show. And I would so appreciate you helping me back. Thank you. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare or other professional advice. Information is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. If you have any health concerns, always consult your doctor. 